J.T. Crowley is talking books. On this show, you'll hear from emerging talent and seasoned veterans from around the world. Hello, I'm J.T. Crowley, and today I have another fascinating author for you all, Frank Talibur from Chilliwack in British Columbia, Canada, to talk about three of his books that he has written. He's written quite a few books, everybody, believe you me. When you look at the written introduction, you'll see there's a list of books there. But we're going to talk about three of them today. And they are Seeds of Ascension, Book One, Spirits Awakening, The Joining, The Ainsworth Chronicles, Book One, and Raven's Lament, the first book in the Still Waters Run Deep series. Frank's books will appeal to those that love urban fantasy, crime, mystery, paranormal, spiritual, and science fiction. Perhaps I I could have just summarised there and said, he writes all genres. That might have been a lot quicker, everybody, to say he writes all genres. Brad Talibur was born in Bivolodge, Alberta. When he was a young child, he moved with his family to Edmonton, Alberta. As a young adult, though, Fed up of the long Canadian winters in Alberta, he moved to Chilliwack in British Columbia, where he has remained to this present day. He's worked for decades and with his head under a car bonnet. And sometimes he's had to tell the locals there that it's not worth fixing. This car is just not worth fixing. Take it to the knacker's yard or... See if you can get any money for the scrap. Because sometimes the locals have asked him, just please, can you just stick some more sticking plasters back on it just to get us through the winter? And he's sometimes he's gone, no. <laughs> and sometimes, yes, depending on the, uh, you know, some people, some, you know, I found that some people will spend $10,000 fixing a $1,000 car. And some people have a ten thousand dollar car and won't spend fifty bucks on it. It's it's bananas, it's, you know. It's crazy. And it's also he's managed automobile shops. He drives yeah. his wife Jenny completely around the twist at times when he gets up in the middle of the night, having said some kind of or having had some kind of apparition for the next scene in his latest book that he's writing. Yep. So. Let's invite him onto the show to talk about himself and, of course, his books. Frank Talabar, come and join me. Hi, hi, John. Thanks for having me on your show. And uh, you're right, I have got up most of the time in the middle of night writing. In fact, one of my customers actually bought me a pen that lights up in the dark so I can still lay in bed instead of being sitting on the bog writing stuff with my wife pounding on the door saying, get out, I gotta go! <laughs> <laughs> um, Frank... Uh, before we dive into the three books, yep. uh, would you care to spend a little time here telling, you know, telling us a little about yourself and what drives you to write these mammoth books? Well, um, it's been mentioned my mum's background ancestry is Hungarian. And uh, it, it's that's the thing where that gypsy background, that's the thing where, where I get my muse from. Um, when, when I hear people... I often ask customers stories, but I also get crazy stories from customers, and it just twists my mind. And as a writer, I've always asked myself, what if? So the question is, well, what if this actually happened with this? And I love weaving things together like that. So I usually weave two or three plot lines together um, that you wouldn't normally think of and try to then to try to figure out how is this is going to work in my head, you know, that, that's how my mind works, uh, and I love doing it. You know, the more convoluted sometimes, the 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 more end result I get. That and, and people, I had one editor say to me one time, "I have no idea how you pulled all this stuff off, but it worked so bloody well at the end." Thank you. I said, "You're you're welcome." <laughs> <laughs> uh, Frank, if I may, um, I want to head straight to um, the first book we're going to talk about. Seeds of Ascension, Spirits Awakening book one in this series. Now, you say this would be an ideal book for those that love spiritual and science fiction genres. The story is breathtaking. 
told over 10 chapters. The main protagonist is Roger Harrison. And he definitely had a very distinctive honeymoon, everybody. Discovering a foreign object in his body, in the shape of an alien piece of metal. Mm. What powers that piece of metal has is very interesting. So the book is, touches on things like ascension of humanity, guardian angels, alien hunters, 6,000-year-old Atlantean. This is a busy, busy book. And so my question to you, Frank, is why the characters to support the overriding story here and why the story, basically? Well, the whole concept is the fact that um, I believe that we're kind of one of several million races in the universe or even in this galaxy and that they've kind of isolated us until we're ready to, to ascend to join the rest of the races um, until we're ready. You know, if the whole world could self-destruct or, or whatever. We don't know. So they're tests. So they have a testing program and they just pick up people. In this case, um, Roger was one of six or seven young guys at a summer camp um, that they uh, implemented these alien pieces into. Um, there's other ones and other humans as well. And then there's several agents that are not just app tracking Roger to see how he does, there, but there's other agents on the planet also with other humans all around the world. So there could be some in Russia or some, in, in fact, they, there's one in, in Australia. Um, and the whole idea is just to see if on, generally, if, if even if one can make it, you know, to accept everything. And the concept of the spiritual part of it is, is that one of the testing programs is that, that each, each person has to go through basically like the seven levels of chakras. Um, and each, because each level of chakra kind of builds up to, to the end in your head where the, the spiritual chakra is. So the whole idea is you have to kind of, you get tested on each one of these. And if you pass it, then you move on to the next level. And if, if you can conceptualize and pass all these chakras, then you in essence are becoming a more powerful being yourself and you're ready to enter what's out there without getting freaked out because you're now at the level of, of these other races. Let's go uh, to chapters two and eight in this book. I'm gonna start off with chapter two. Now you start the scene here with Sheridan naked in a downtown Seattle hotel room. A being by the name Zolna making his first visit to Earth. He's got red cornea, slitted eyes and reptilian nose. Roger and Beth's experience in the cab on the route to the airport for the honeymoon. Well, that's very interesting, everybody. It definitely allows a start to a honeymoon. So... I think a lot of the audience here, Frank, are going to be intrigued already. Say, so, what's in this book? What's in this chapter? What's in this story? So you tell us. He's seen Sharita before. He calls him. He calls her his guardian angel. So he's he's kind of had glimpses of her because she's kind of studying him, you know, and monitoring him. And um, what happens right away is is that um, not just the Pleiadians are, are testing us. There's other races that don't want us to ascend into the rest of the universe. So Zolnar is one of these. He's actually a reptilian a creature from a you know planet of reptiles that dominated the world. And he's about to stop this because he's obviously got huge interest involved in not having Earth ascend because he's, he's got clients and customers that want to, you know, whatever, make money off of Earth. So she's almost immediately being hunted by him and, and the other agents as well. Um, so, so she's trying to survive so that she can not only get Roger to do his mission, but survive herself, basically. There you go. And if you want to know more, go and look at the chapter. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> I ain't telling anymore. <laughs> oh, there's nothing like a good sales pitch, is there? Yeah. Now, the other chapter, Frank, that I want to go to, so is that we can give the audience uh, a little bit more insight as to what's in this book. Chapter 8. Sheridan is alone in a large cellar. You talk about explosions in her classroom. Expect the unexpected. Sheridan, 
willing herself away from the enticement of the trapped spirit. What's the role of the creature that's with her in the cellar? Hmm. I found that very fascinating. So, but it's playing with her, isn't it? This creature is teasing her and has the ability to read her thoughts. What's the significance of the crystal in the storyline? And the significance of Roger and Fred and Bill meeting up and the old Seattle pizza restaurant, Sam and Theodore. So where are you taking the readers here with the scenes and the narratives in this chapter? Thank you. Um, so Rita, um, this isn't when she's training to become an agent before they accept her for this mission or any missions. She has to go through a huge training sequence of events. In this one, um, she has to figure out how to defeat this creature and it is playing with her. Um, this creature is quite evil. It, it, it lives off the, I think, the spiritual essence of, of other beings. It kind of sucks them up and, 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 and that's what he uses to survive. But she has to figure out how to defeat this thing in order to get the crystal. Once she has a crystal, then she can zoom up back to her to the the spaceship that she's been you know uh, downloaded from. Um, so it's all part of the, her training. And um, yes, a lot of agents. Um, I, I don't actually say this in the book, but a lot of agents probably do die in these missions because they're very dangerous because they have to be able to think so far out of the box in case something happens, which in, we found out in chapter one, this is exactly what happened. As for um, Roger and Theodore and all the other ones in, in the pizza place, they, they've all had alien metal in them. Um, none of the other ones really have a, a guardian angel type thing. Um, Theodore I used as a very interesting person because he's the one, like Roger himself um, does not believe in any of this stuff. He's just, he's just a sales guy, and he says to himself, why am I being picked? I, I'll, I just sell stuff. Theodore, though, is the, is the one that, that, that looks at all the other alternative. He, he, he's, he's researched all about the pyramids, all of, everything about them, all about these other races that were on Earth. So he's done tons of research. So he's trying to prove to Roger that, that there is life out there. You don't believe me, but I've got enough evidence here. And he's trying to convince him to say that. So he's kind of the, the guy he's bouncing back against. That's why I used him. Now, you say this book is for lovers of spiritual and science fiction genres. Huh. So what points in the book would you strongly say reflect the spiritual side and the science fiction side for those lovers of those genres? Well, mainly the all the chakra scenes and some of the chapters that we haven't mentioned, there, there's long pieces of, of chakra uh, scenes where Roger's being tested by this alien being, um, but he's making him experience his levels of chakra and, and, and what and what they're all about and, and, and if he can learn from this so that he can pass this test. Um, that's kind of the whole idea. That's where more of the spirituality comes from because I strongly believe that there is all this kind of life out there on a dimension far above us. Um, and that's kind of what I'm trying to incorporate into the book. Uh, all these other dimensions of beings and, and creatures that that you know, most of us go well. That's insane, but maybe it is. But I, I, you know, I believe we're this. We're the third dimension. You know, there's there's other dimensions out there that people have discovered, basically. And um, and that and leave that into the science fiction aspect because um, this the sci-fi act, uh, aspect. Sorry, because um, a lot of this stuff, you know, people that, that read science fiction will kind of when he goes to other worlds and other beings and other dimensions. So I kind of weave the two together, which to me seemed like a natural cast to have them two, two walk together. I thought you'd say it's going to be in all the other chapters that we've not covered off because <laughs> there are it, they are in the other chapters, what I've just yeah. said here about you know the spiritual and the science fiction uh, parts of this book. They are in the other chapters, everybody. But we're not going to go to them. If you want to yep. find out about them, go and have a look. Go buy the book. Absolutely. Frank, let's take the audience to the second book. We're going to talk about The Joining, book one of the Ainsworth Chronicles. Here we have 18 chapters of exhilarating twists and turns for those that love urban fantasy, crime, mystery, 
and paranormal genres. The story kicks off um, with a nearly naked FBI agent thumping down into the lobby of the Fairmont Express Hotel in Victoria, British Columbia, to have a confrontation with the undercover female detective, Carol Ainsworth, the main protagonist in the book, who has set herself up as the duty manager for that day. The drama quickly unfolds with the hanging of a member of the Mafia mob gang and the abduction of Carol Ainsworth's nephew. We also have an aging psychic playing a dominant role in the book. We have mafia romances. We have supernatural forces, a crystal skull, and a whole host of other happenings to capture the reader's imagination in this book. Why did you write this book as the first in the Ainsworth Chronicles? And why did you give the characters the characteristics they have? Do you love creating this story? And did you love these characters? To be honest, I absolutely did. Um, I started doing some research. My son was working in Victoria at the time. And I started doing some research only to discover that it's probably one of the most haunted cities in the world. They have probably 30 or 40 ghost stories recorded of all these different happenings. Um, then once I started doing the research, I also discovered that ley lines actually run through Victoria, which in England, you've probably heard of ley lines. Oh, um, yes. Lines of energy, right? And also, there's, and I, one of the other things I discovered was there's actually a time vortex in Victoria as well. So as a, as a, as a writer, when I start reading up all this stuff, I'm like, wow, I, all this stuff I can weave into, into a book, which is what I've done here. Um, we use the time vortex, we use the ley lines because of this trapped spiritual energy. The, the book is about two mafia families coming in for a wedding, only they're not there for a wedding, but both one of the families is bringing a strong curse with them, which is upsetting all the spirits, all the ghosts, and all, everything that's in Victoria. And that's kind of the whole idea of this, 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 this book um, where it's written. I had Carol in other books as well. She's a very strong-willed female's lead detective. Um, she's discovered that she had to be bigger and braver than most of the males she deals with because in her line of work, police work, you know, usually some of the males are, are nice guys, but a lot of them are just complete buttheads and, and they, you know, they won't listen to her. Her boss though does because he knows that she's smarter and more than any of these other guys. And that's why she got the lead role for this gig. She's a tough cookie. Yes, she's a tough cookie. She's a tough cookie. And she has to think, again, outside of the box, too. Um, yeah. So in, in this book, she, she, starts, she starts weaving together all these ideas of why are all these ghosts upset? And, all, and you know, she has to so, figure this all out as a detective. Does she figure it out, everybody? Hmm. <laughs> Read the book. <laughs> We're not going to say. We're not going to say. Okay, let's reveal some of the contents of the book. Uh, by going to chapters 1, 10, and 15, starting naturally, of course, with chapter 1. Now, I liked the scene in the hotel lobby with FBI agent uh, Jake Holden, and I thought I felt really sorry for poor Samuel, the front desk man, being badly manhandled by Jake. And I also thought, hmm, Carol very cool and calmly dealt with uh, this very brash FBI agents. I thought, yes, yeah, this was a very powerful start to the book. Um, but I also love the characters, you know, Sandy and Cindy. So as first chapters go, it's very, very good opening gambit, everybody. So Frank, would you like to tell the audience what you put in these scenes and how it forms the baseline for the entire book? Well, as you said, uh, he's an FBI agent, but Carol does not know that. Um, when when she opens up, all she knows is this guy's thumping down these stairs, and he's very upset. He's been locked out of his hotel room, and he's virtually naked except for a towel. Um, but she is quite used to uh, dealing with upfront men, and she realizes that at, in, in the hotel, you know, paying manager, she has to deal with the way that she normally normally probably grab them and uh, you know, handcuff them and haul them away, but she can't because there's guests around, there's other people around. So she has to deal with them in a, a manner un, unlike she does. 
Um, well, she also gets a phone call um, about her nephew now, who's who's in big trouble, and that opens the, the first scene up. And later, um, we discover in one of the other chaps we talk about is that yeah, she he he likes her, <laughs> you know, he wants to date her. Um, he's attracted to her because of the fact that she's strong-willed. Yeah. But he's not meant to be there chasing women, is he? He's supposed to be doing something else. But hey, we're not going to go right. Right. <laughs> doing that. No, no, no. Okay. Now I thought, uh, Frank, chapter 10 was quite a pivotal chapter in the book. We're more than halfway in the plot. Is the room that Antonio Risolto's body was discovered spooked? Hmm. Does Agnes have psychic powers? for she senses a lot of disturbance in the room. Old spirits? Hmm. Carol needing to watch her back. Sleep with one eye open. Agnes's quick exit out of the room. Jake wanting to put listening and tracking devices on a boat. On a boat. The trip out to the boat in Victoria Harbour and boarding it. This was a chapter um, I found was exciting. So Frank, fill us in with what's going on in this part of the book and where's it taking the reader to with regards to the other chapters coming down the line? Hmm. Uh, got it. Um, Agnes is a psychic. She, she used to do a stage show and she still does, but she's older, she's in her 70s. Um, she's, she bears a crystal skull that, that enables her to actually read minds. And people think, oh, that's, that's insane, but it, it is. And it actually drives Carol crazy because Carol's thinking something and Agnes says, oh no, I'm not, I'm not a quote bitch like you just thought. And she goes, what? <laughs> so she knows she can read her mind and that drives her bananas. Um, so now she has to kind of watch her thoughts. So Agnes picks up lots of vibrations as well and, and uh, energy. She, the, uh, the Fairmont Empress Hotel, by the way, does have four or five resident ghosts that people have reported over the years. So she can sense them. And some of the rooms are extremely haunted. Frank, let's quickly head off to chapter 15, for we do have another book to investigate after this one. Here we have the man dressed like Humphrey Bogart. We've got the postcard, the crash. Agnes the Old Spiritualist, Mad Italians, Satanic Rituals, Five Chairs in a Semicircle, Sleeping Boys. It's all going on here, isn't it? This is you ramping up the storyline to engage with the readers. Would you care to comment as to what you're exposing the readers to here? I usually like to, I, I won't, tell the readers much about anything. I usually just like whack them between the eyes and pull them into the scene. So we have all these scenes happening and to, to completely pull the reader through the chapter. Um, Agnes like has also convinced Carol to put her through the time vortex, which unfortunately now has altered a few things. Uh, when, when, and Carol has, when, when, when Carol goes back to the hotel, she realizes that a lot's changed and she's thinking am i crazy um so so agnes has done something here on purpose um the yes yeah, she discovers a room full of all the boys and all the clues that led her to there um because she's trying to get her, one of them is her nephew and she's trying to get him back um and it like i said i i just this kind of then leads us to the next section of the book um without telling anybody anything else about the book there you go. He's good at dropping hints, isn't he, to tell you to go and buy the book. <laughs> <laughs> He's done this before, everybody. I have. <laughs> he has. <laughs> now, um, Frank, let's go to the third book, um, yep. Raven's Lament. The third book we're going to talk about. This is the first book in the Still Waters Run Deep series. I told you, everybody, Frank Teleper has written a fair number of books and he has more in the pipeline, believe me. He's like a writing machine, but there you go. Now, there are 13 chapters of glorious storytelling here. The narrative initially concerns the felling of the old growth forest, the sobbing trees as they were axed to their death. A rare tree that has something noteworthy about it. A shaman, a local reporter, 
Brooke Grant. Love, gained and lost, to what and who? Are Brooke and the Shaman really setting out to save a woman? Or something more sinister that threatens to change the world as we know it? But more importantly, what was released from that rare tree in the old growth forest, now fallen? Well, let's ask Frank to tell us all what this book is about and where did he get the idea for the book? And of course, how did he create the characters? But more importantly, why did he create the characters? Frank, reveal as much as you can without giving the game away here. Well, to be honest, the whole idea for this book I got when I was sitting in a museum in Victoria. They have a, they have a First Nations room. It's dark, it's down there. And as I sat there, they have all these totems all around the room that they've got from Haida Gwaii and all along the coast. And as I sat there all by myself looking, I swear up and down, I could hear voices talking to me. Um, and then just after that visit, that's when the, the true story came out about the cutting down of the golden spruce tree. So the the, um, the the true story behind it is uh, a guy in protest of logging cut down this rare tree. The Haida believe that there's a prince trapped inside this tree, and that's why the leaves are turned golden sorrel for this prince. So he he then releases the prince, um, who is now evolving through the book into something else. Um, but he also releases the reason he was trapped there in the first place. So that that that's what I kind of wove into the book as to what's going on between all these people. And I had, um, I ran into a, one of my customers was a First Nations person. And he said, yes, he says, so you're very intuitive. And and the a lot of the First Nations people died very fast. And all our traditions are oral. So they die without having a chance to relate them to the next generation. They're all gone. So a lot of the spirits, we believe the spirits, when they die, they don't pass on. They, they go into the next generation or two generations down the road. And they're all looking for someone to connect to and talk to and experience that story. And that is one of, well, not one of the reasons why I wrote the book, but it made me realize, yeah, I, I, I'm, never, I'm not First Nations at all, but being around here, I, I'm very in tune with the way they think, the way they do it. And I've had a couple of First Nations people actually say to me, you think and write more along the lines of someone from a First Nations background than everyone, anyone I've ever read which was a very nice comment. Very nice comment. So let's go to two chapters, uh, Frank, that caught my um, vivid imagination. And they are chapters two and nine. Okay. So let's start with chapter two. You start the chapter, I quote, in italics, 40 out of 60 haters who left Victoria for the North one month ago had died. The sick and dead with their canoes, blankets, guns, etc., were left along the coast. In one encampment about 12 miles above Nanquimo, Captain Osgood counted 12 dead Indians, the bodies festering in the noonday sun. This was an article, you say there, from the British Colonist News article, June the 21st, 1862. You have two scenes um, here, one in 1862 and one in the modern world, but both scenes deal with a plague and death. In 1862, you have Prince Kidakis, who, with his servant slave, Wago, Sire Hugh, and I make a very deep apologizing to everybody with my pronunciations here. I have tried. And I am tripping over them, but you know, Frank's laughing at me at the moment. I think you wrote them just to annoy me. <laughs> <laughs> um, Sagul, the shaman, the death of one of the prince's father's wives, raising concerns. Sagul does not have the power to overcome what's happening to the village. And in the other scene, we have Chelon Davisha, her grandmother Rosemary. Charlie Stillwater, who viewed Rosemary as his mother. Rosemary's death from the plague. Hmm. And we've got Brooke Grant investing. It was like leaving the civilised world and journeying into another land and another time. Hardigwe, 
literally means translation wise is islands on the boundary between worlds. And when I looked at the book and I thought, why have you set the scenes here as it is? Why are you flipping back and forth between the time zones? Um, you know, the plagues, the camps. I think it's a great story. So why did you write it? Well, the, the going back in time, I kind of wanted to portray what was happening to what most people don't realize that in North America, um, almost one third of all the First Nations people lived on the BC coast area. So it was very, very populated and very dense. And they had no immunity to a lot of diseases that the Caucasian people brought over. So what I wanted to portray was some of the horrors of what they were going through at the time um, and trying to deal with the fact that everybody they know around them is dying. And 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 that's where the prince comes in because he's he's a very no, noble um person and he believes in, in looking after his people so the, his question is how do i do this when I, everyone around me is dying of this disease we have no uh, no idea what's going on so that's where uh, prince kadayas goes after trying to find somebody to save his people is his his his, his, his whole plan the the first in that chapter two what opens is um uh shaylin's talking to her, her grandmother who's dying but she's 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 relaying all, most of the conversation in official Haida language. So I did a lot of research um, and found books that 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 pronounce things and and their meanings in Haida, and I put the, them together in the book as 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 best as I could, um, just how it would actually be spoken. Um, and for those people that are interested in languages, so it's it's a very what they call guttural language. So you you, you speak strongly from the back of your throat. So it's kid katayas. It's it's that's how you kind of pronounce it, not softly like we do. Um, Haida Gwai is, is the pronunciation of, of the islands. There you go, everyone. That's how to pronounce it. Not like me. <laughs> <laughs> Perhaps I should have had a lesson before we actually did the interview on how to pronounce some of these uh, wonderful, <laughs> wonderful names. Yeah. There we go. Um, let's take the audience, Frank, to chapter nine. Uh, like most of the chapters in this book, you start off with a clipping of some kind. And here we have, from my sitting with the older people and learning the stories and stuff, it would give you a lot better understanding of where we are if you could have known some of your deeper history and some of the stories that relate to us. But it would be almost hard for you to understand if we're in these stories it's almost quite often you can't tell if they are talking about an animal or human being. And there is the ability of the human being to transform into animals and animals transform into human beings. And that is because the people were so close to that land and still are. And this is the um, testimony in defense of stopping logging in Lyle Island's court case. And it was Good Job Haida, 1985. So start off as saying, have I got that pronunciation right? No doubt I haven't. <laughs> no, you don't. It's good, good guy, good, good Jayas, I think is, is how you pronounce it. Even uh, he struggles with that. It's a hard G to start. Um, and it, it, and he's, he's, he's right. So he's Haida, and he's trying to explain to, to everybody else who does not understand the connection between First Nations and the Earth. As far as they're concerned, both are one being. And that's why they're in protest against all the logging on their land, because you're cutting down part of your own essence. And the way that's the way the Haida look at the world, um, totally different than us. Um, it's um, it, one of the things I learned when, in researching a lot of stuff about the Haida and other First Nations is, is that they, they look at life way way different than we do and i try to portray a lot of that in that in the, in the book so that people have a better understanding of how first nations people think and believe different than we do mm -hmm. basically so the storyline starts off with brooke hiking out to the wreck of pastuta a barge ran aground in 1928 a wonder on the beach, 
a note waiting for him back at his hotel room from he for he assumed was from Charlie. He's supposed to be investigating, not chasing women. Hmm. The paper story of the White Raven, local community politics. Charlie's shamanic travels, semi-precious gemstones, Martin Crow, Martha Stewart, ravens walking away with wolf grizzle bears, the golden spruce has been downed, upsetting the balance in the other worlds, releasing both the white raven and the raven himself. And again, so that gives people an idea of what's coming in this chapter, but again, you flip the story from the present to the past, plus lots, lots more. Why is this an important chapter that you wrote at this stage of the book? Yeah, it's important because what I wrote at the beginning is, is they do believe that um, a lot of beings can shape shift. And Brooke, when he meets with, with Charlie in, in the pub with Shaylin, Charlie's trying to tell him this, and he doesn't believe him one bit. He's a reporter. He just believes in facts. Yet they meet this, this guy called Martin Crow, who is not Martin Crow. Um, he's actually a raven in disguise, and and Charlie starts senses this, and he kind of knows it, uh, not for sure. Um, and but I won't, and I won't reveal why uh, the ravens after uh, Brooke. There's a reason for it. Um, but Brooke thinks no, that that's not possible. Um, and Charlie says, oh yeah. Um, and so that's that's, that's kind of why I wove that that part in at the beginning of the of the chapter. A lot of the inserts were to deal with certain things re relating to the chapters themselves, um, and uh, and and everything that now Brooke has to start, start figuring out what's happening because all things are happening around him that he has no concept of. And Charlie says, "Well, it's it's all natural to us," and that's why I wove it in there. It does. And do you know what? When you look at the uh, the book, everybody, there's so many twists and turns and, you know, who's who. Um, and Frank does a brilliant job of keeping you engaged throughout the whole of the book. And like all of his books, he, he really does keep you engaged. Um, his books are real page turners. And I'm not just saying that because I'm interviewing him. It's because, yes, I've looked at his books and he kept me entertained. Just like he's done on this interview here. <laughs> I, if, if I can interject, I have a, a recent review I got that was about Raven's Lament. It's it's a very powerful review, and, and I, it blew me away when I got this. This is only about two weeks ago. Um, this is from the Whistler Independent Book Club Awards, um, the, the fiction evaluation of Raven's Lament. And this, this, this judge said, easy to follow and immerse oneself to this well-told story. The pace unfolds so naturally that I forgot I was reading, which is essential to achieving this result. Love the narrative voice that brought characters to life through vivid descriptions and unforced dialogue. Time and place are masterfully captured through poetic and beautiful imagery. The writing style is wonderful, a celebration of words, both visual and imaginative. The story has depth. The themes are felt and, and lingered long after I finished reading it. The pulse of energy, otherworldly. Raven's Lament is a classic in waiting with dreamlike narration. I loved every inch of it. And I've had many people say to me, some of the scenes that I wrote, like, like the scenes of, of, of Kid Krayas traveling as an earth spirit through the trees and, and the things he encounters, uh, it's the most, most evocative and uh, memorial things they've ever read. Um, many people have said that to me, wow, that I just blew me away. And you know, as, as a writer, I go, thank you. That's, if I can get a compliment like that from a reader, I've done my job. You have indeed. That's my pat on the back for writing books like this. So apart from these three books, um, you've got other books which we've listed on the written introduction. What's coming down the line? What's the next one you're going to get out in the middle of the bed, middle of, and get out the bed in the middle of the night for with a crazy idea? <laughs> <laughs> well, um, the Innsworth series, I have two books out currently. The third one I'm in the middle of writing right now. That one's on, on, I'm calling Into the Dark Side, um, where Carol has to delve into something going on um, with a lot of people that are disappearing and, and do the drug overdoses. 
but there's a darker thing happening that, that she just is, is starting to discover. I'm also working on, I have book two and three of the Ascension series written. I'm just re-editing them and, and adding a bit more to them because I've written them quite a while ago, to be honest. Um, so book two should be out pretty soon. Um, I'm also then working on another series of books, totally different than anything else I've done, um, another genre, um, with a, a woman that, that basically uh, is an empty nester. She, her kids have left, and, but, and, and, and the, the whole tagline of this book is, well, what if your mother gave you up, not because she didn't love you, but because she was trying to keep you from an ancient curse? And by discovering the mother, who she was, guess what? Uh -huh. so who do you see frank as your market you know um but more important who would you like to see reading your books and where can people get your books from well they can get my books through that drop to digital has them through separate several lines through a lot of the bookstores so you can look them up in the bookstores mainly they're all on amazon right now so you can get the ebooks and the print books on amazon for people to love either one i'm just working on getting audio books out for for a couple of these books as well of the ones we talked about so that should be out in a few months because um, a lot of people now are doing audio books uh, more than ebooks or print, um, which I get. It's, it's an evolving market. Uh, I love people that, that love to be um, – my market is, is to grab people basically you know, by the hair and, and drag them into my book screaming. So people that love intense books so they can just get sucked in right away and, 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 and just get flung across the book, which is kind of what I do. Uh, a lot of people that love urban fantasy stuff. Um, some people like crime, crime fiction as well, but I think my biggest market is, is urban fantasy because I love dealing with that kind of genre, that kind of thing where you, you can make up this being, but you have to make it realistic. So people will believe you that this thing could exist. And that's the trick. There's a trick to his books, everyone. <laughs> I have to say, um, I first started, oh, so I first met Frank uh, about summertime. Yep. Um, when I had a look at his books and I asked him if he'd like to come on the show and he said yes. And uh, for various reasons, uh, we've delayed it until about now. But I have to say, I've been totally, you know, it's been an absolute hoot. Um, you know, interviewing him. He's made me laugh all the time. And when I look at his books and some of his characters, I'm thinking, I think I can see Frank Talibur in some of these characters here, but I'm not going to say which <laughs> ones. I'm thinking, I think he's writing about himself here. And I'm, or I'm thinking, I think he would have liked to be in this person. Absolutely correct. I and I also inject I a lot of humor into a lot of my scenes. Um, we didn't really mention that, but a lot of scenes are very funny. And, and some of the scenes I've had people say to me, you know, I almost peed myself laughing at this scene. It was so good. I said, thank you. You know, it, it, I always believe that even though some of the themes are dark, um, in the end, the good guy or the good girl, um, the good, the hero or heroine must win somehow. And, and that's my whole belief. So that, you know, whatever they come up against, they have to come ahead. Otherwise, it'd be a very dark jury world, personally. It would. It would indeed. Frank Talaba, thank you very much for coming on my show, Talking Books. John, it was an ultimate pleasure. I had a riot. <laughs> we and did I, have a riot. you laugh. <laughs> oh, we did have a riot, everybody. Believe you me. Believe you me. We've had a riot. There you go. I'm JT Crowley. Thanks for listening, watching, wherever you're in the world. Stay safe until next time. 